Thank you for joining the National Headache Foundation's Headache Myths webinar. We're joined this evening by Emily Rubenstein Engel. Dr. Engel graduated from Drexel Medical School in 1998 and she completed her neurology residency at UCLA Medical Center in 2002. She's currently the Associate Director of the D'Alessio Headache Center at Scripps Clinic. Dr. Engel, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. It's a pleasure to do so, and um, webinars are always a great forum. I'm sorry I can't see any of your faces, but it certainly, it certainly makes for a convenient uh, lecture. Nobody has to drive very far. So um, it's always my pleasure to get to speak directly to patients. And what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is the fact that there's so much misinformation out there about headaches, which is such a shame because it's such a common diagnosis. Um, in particular, uh, physicians are very influenced by patients' self-diagnosis. For example, um, if you were to go into your doctor and say, I have a sinus headache, the literature actually shows that your physician will say, fine, here's some antibiotics. So I find it's very important to for the patient to be as educated as he or she can be about their particular diagnosis to in fact help to steer their doctor in the right direction. One of the most common misconceptions about severe headaches is patients feel that they are alone in this problem and that people can't understand what they're going through and that not many other people have this experience. In fact, that's not the case at all, and headache is a very common problem. And one of the key points that I'm hoping to drive home uh, today to you is that the most common cause of recurring uh, disabling headache is migraine. And migraine tends to be forgotten, and people will often, including physicians, will often um, ascribe other headache diagnoses before diagnosing a patient with migraine. And I'm trying to turn that around and have people really think of migraine first in a patient who has recurring bad headache. And in fact, a study that came out in 2004 um, went so far as to say that patients with episodic disabling headaches with an otherwise normal exam are most likely to have migraine in the absence of any other contradictory evidence. So I'd like to proceed to uh, explain this to you further so that you um, approach your headache problem with the most likely explanation and diagnosis. Um, a migraine is very common. There are almost 30 million migraine sufferers in the United States. And the majority are female, although males have migraine as well. And one in four households has at least one migraine sufferer. And the prevalence peaks between the ages of 25 and 55. What the literature shows is that most patients remain undiagnosed with a diagnosis of my, uh, with a uh, with a condition of migraine. And why is this? Why is it that um, approximately 50% of patients with migraine are not diagnosed as having that condition? Why are more than 14 million migraine patients in the United States not diagnosed as having migraine? Well. In part, it's because they're given these other diagnoses. Migraine patients are often told that they have tension headache or that they have sinus headache. And one of the goals of the lecture today is to try to show you that almost every time a patient is told they have tension headache or sinus headache, it's actually migraine. So let's look at the diagnostic criteria for migraine. The International Headache Society has established criteria for migraine, and they consist of episodic headache lasting 4 to 72 hours with any two from a column on the left and any one from a column on the right. So on the left, we see that it's unilateral, meaning one-sided, or throbbing, or worsened with movement, or moderate to severe. And on the column on the right, we see that there's nausea or vomiting, photophobia, and phonophobia, which is light sensitivity or sound sensitivity. 
Now, what I really want you to get out of this slide is that it's only required to have two from the column on the left. So what that means is that your headache can be bilateral and non-throbbing which means it can be diffuse, it can be a band-like distribution, it can just feel like pressure. But as long as it's worsened with physical activity, like climbing stairs, for example, and as long as it's moderate or severe, and you have nausea, it meets criteria for migraine. So there's a common misconception that migraine always has to be one-sided, it always has to be throbbing, and in fact, that's not the case. Another myth about migraine is patients think, well, I don't have migraine because I don't vomit. In fact, vomiting is not a required um, condition for the diagnosis of migraine, and fewer than 30% of patients actually vomit with their migraines. Another myth about migraine is I don't have migraine because I don't see flashing lights. Now, flashing lights are what's called an aura. And migraine with aura is not that common. The bulk of patients with migraine do not have aura. 75 to 80 percent of migraine patients do not have aura. So you don't have to see flashing lights before your headache or whisper headache in order for it to meet criteria for migraine. Another misconception that I touched on earlier is a lot of patients feel and a lot of physicians feel that if the pain is not one-sided, and if it doesn't pulsate, it's not migraine. And this is so important, I'd like to go over it again. And the literature shows that 41% of patients with migraine have pain on both sides of their head, bilateral. And the pain can be felt anywhere. It can be felt in the front of the head, the back of the neck, in the face or sinus area, around the eyes. And 50% of the time, the pain does not pulsate. Another common misconception is I don't have migraine because I have headache all the time. It's not uncommon for migraine patients to have some kind of headache almost every day. And this is something that we call chronic migraine. And in fact, 25% of patients with migraine have at least one migraine attack per week. And an attack can last for a couple days. So that already adds up to many headache days per, per month. And in addition, there's a diagnosis called chronic migraine which is where you have headache greater than 15 days a month, which is some type of headache on more days than you don't have headache. So let's talk about the anatomy of migraine, which leads to a lot of the misdiagnosis and misconception as to the cause of patients' headaches. The pain center of the brain is called a trigeminal nucleus, and it's deep in the brain stem which can be felt as the back of the head and the neck area. This then activates the trigeminal nerves that come out behind the eye to the sinus area and down to the teeth. This has led to this idea of sinus headache. Many patients, many physicians diagnose patients as having sinus headache. This, um, this comes to be because many patients feel that their headaches are triggered by weather, and for some reason that leads people to think of their sinuses, which is not exactly clear to me, actually. And also, migraines can have sinus symptoms. Now, we'll talk about that more in a moment, but they looked at this and they found that the majority of patients who are diagnosed with sinus headache actually meet criteria for migraine. The literature ranges from 88% to 96% of patients who are told that they have sinus headache actually have migraine. And up to 50% of patients with migraine report that their headaches are influenced by the weather. And this has been validated. There is a weather trigger to migraine. It's not understood why that is. And almost half of patients with migraine have sinus-like symptoms, including nasal stuffiness and runny nose. Now, the reason for this is because the pain of migraine can be felt in the distribution of the trigeminal nerves that we talked about before, and one of the more common locations is in the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is in the sinus area. So it's very common for patients to feel their migraines in their sinuses. Now, the trigeminal pathways are bilateral, meaning that they have branches to both sides of the head, 
So this is part of the reason why patients will feel their headaches on both sides of their head. The interesting thing about the trigeminal nucleus that's involved in migraine is that it, patients do not just feel the pain in that area, but the nerves actually activate the sinus tissue and can cause stuffiness and inflammation in the area of the sinuses. You can see that box on the, on the left-hand side. So all of that tissue can become inflamed and actually puffy and stuffy. So migraine patients, when they go to the doctor, are often given prescriptions for antihistamines, nasal steroids, decongestants, antibiotics, and many patients are taking lots of OTCs, which is over-the-counter medications, for their migraines, in part because they've been told that they have sinus headache. Let's go on to another common myth about migraine. A lot of patients feel that they have really bad tension headaches or they're told by their doctor that they have bad tension headaches. A very interesting study that came out in 2004 presented such a strong opinion that it really made an impact on me and the conclusion was that tension type headache does not appear to be sufficiently troublesome to result in a physician visit. The act of making an appointment with your primary care doctor to complain about headache makes tension headache unlikely. 86% of the time, the patient who self-diagnosed non-migraine actually had migraine. Now, part of the reason that migraine patients are given a diagnosis of tension headache is because the majority of migraine patients have neck pain with their migraines. And they'll describe tightness and, stuffing and stiffness and throbbing in the neck area. Now again, if we go back to the anatomy, this can be explained by the location of the trigeminal nucleus, which is essentially in the neck. It's in the brainstem, which comes down into the neck area. And it's common, especially at the onset of migraine, when this area is being activated, to feel pain in your neck and in the back of the head. And again, this is a little bit more of an anatomical drawing showing the location of the nerves and the nucleus that can result in back of the head and neck pain and migraine. And essentially, you again have the trigeminal nucleus that we talked about. You also have the occipital nerves that come out the back of the head and, uh, and other nerves that come out to the top of the neck. Another common misconception is that patients will often think their headaches are coming from eye strain. And as you probably can infer from this diagram, you can see that the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve comes out right behind the eye. So it's very common for patients to feel their headaches in the eye area, to feel like something is pushing their eye out of their head, that there's pressure behind the eye. In addition, it's common that patients are told that TMJ is the cause of their headache, when for the most part, it's just that it's common to feel your, your migraines along the mandibular nerves, which go down to the jaw and to the teeth. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying there's no such thing as TMJ, and TMJ is quite common, as the sinusitis, and a lot of people need glasses, but these are not really the cause of your headaches. It's just that you're feeling the headaches in these areas. So another common myth about migraine is what are valid migraine triggers. The only triggers that have been validated in research as cause of migraine are changes in stress. And interestingly about that, it's not just increase in stress, it's also a sudden drop in stress. For example, a lot of patients will have what's called letdown migraine, where they get their migraines on the weekends or when they're on vacation when their baseline stress level has significantly dropped. In addition, changes in hormones are a common trigger for migraine. It's very common for migraine to worsen with the period and with ovulation and with perimenopause. Um, changes in sleep and lack of sleep. And it's not just lack of sleep. It's 
Um, a lot of patients will, for example, sleep in on the weekend, and an extra few hours of sleep can also trigger migraines. What you want to keep in mind is as much as possible, you really want to keep every day about the same. That means going to sleep about the same time and waking up about the same time. Now, I don't tell my patients to eliminate caffeine from their diet. There's actually a significant amount of data that caffeine in the form of coffee in moderation is good for you. It's been associated with decreased risk of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. The issue in somebody with migraine is that you have to have the same amount of caffeine at the same time every day. For example, if you skip your morning coffee, you're going to get a migraine. So I, I, I advise my patients along these lines, just decide how much you're going to have and have the same amount at the same time every day. Now changes in weather have been validated as a trigger for migraine. This unfortunately is something that you don't have control over, but it's important to be aware of that you're not imagining that when there are these weather changes, it does serve as a trigger. And one of the most important triggers that I want to spend some time on is skipping meals. Skipping meals is a reliable trigger for migraine. And this leads us to our next slide, which is lots of patients feel that because they have migraine, they can't have chocolate or citrus or dairy or cheese. And these are things that they're told from their physicians, and these are um, diets that are all of our very reliable appearing websites. However, it's not based in the science. And in fact, there's science to disprove the idea of specific food triggers. For example, they did a very interesting study and they found that chocolate does not trigger migraine. Now, there's different theories as to why this urban legend about food triggers has evolved and maintained such strength, and there are a couple different reasons why we think this has happened. Number one, at the onset of migraine, even before you're feeling pain, your body tends to crave serotonin-boosting foods such as chocolate, so we almost self-treat in an attempt to prevent the migraine, and so patients crave chocolate and then they get their migraine and they think the chocolate caused the migraine. There's also something called recall bias, where understandably people try to find what caused this, and I have a terrible migraine, and what did I eat? But as most of you probably know, when you keep a food diary, it's really rare to actually find a reliable food that triggers your migraines. Now that said, if you do feel that there's something that triggers your migraines, certainly avoid it. I just, I, I really don't like the idea of, of my patients feeling that they're disabled and that they can't eat oranges or drink milk because it's going to trigger their migraines because really that's not substantiated by the literature and for the most part, as I said, it's urban legend. So what I tell my patients is eat a healthy diet and don't go hungry because skipping meals is a reliable trigger for migraine. So let's move on to treatment. Now that I hope many of us have been educated that the most likely cause of recurring headache is migraine, let's talk about the effective ways to treat migraine. Uh, what I like to what I like to say when I teach the residents or other physicians about this topic is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And what this is really referring to is this very common trap that patients get into where they're taking too much cure, they're taking too many pain medications, and that actually is worsening their headache problem. So a lot of patients feel that they're taking pain medications frequently to prevent their bad headaches. And in fact, to a certain extent, that is true because we do know that if you take your pain medications early, they're more likely to prevent a bad headache, whereas if you wait, then the cat's out of the bag and you already have a bad headache and it's difficult to treat. The problem, though, is that pain medications need to be used sparingly. And at high frequencies, you run this risk that's very common of rebound headache, which more modernly is known as medication overuse headache, which is a self-sustaining headache medication cycle where over time you end up taking more and more pain medication and getting more and more headache. 
This can lead to the transformation of chronic daily headache or chronic migraine. So things that I watch for in my patients and that you can watch for in yourself is when I hear my insurance company only allows me to have 12 tablets a month or I never know if it's a migraine or not, so I wait to treat. These are signs that the patient is having a lot of headaches and probably should be treated with a preventive medication as opposed to more and more pain medications. So let's talk about chronic daily headache. Chronic daily headache is headache greater than 15 days a month, and almost always this begins as episodic migraine, meaning the patient has one or two headaches a month, and over months or years becomes chronic. It occurs in at least 4% of the American population. There's literature to show that it's actually more common than that. And it may be an iatrogenic condition. Iatrogenic means physician-caused, meaning that you go to your physician and you say, I'm having lots of headaches, and the physician says, take Vicodin, take Furacet, take more Excedrin, as opposed to addressing the underlying issue, hence the term iatrogenic. Risk factors for chronic daily headache include medication overuse that we talked about, being overweight, snoring, and probably having sleep apnea, drinking too much alcohol, and stress. And medication overuse headache is quite common. 1% of the population has it. It's probably more. And any kind of headache medication can cause medication overuse headache. And the treatment is withdrawal of the pain medications with initiating a preventive medication. Now, I want to spend some time on that second bullet that, say, that showed that any kind of pain medication can cause medication overuse headache. Um, a common myth is that over-the-counter medications are safe because you don't need a prescription to get them. Now, as most of you know, over-the-counter medications like Advil and Excedrin um, have, and Tylenol have been implicated in liver injury, gastric ulcers, and other significant health problems. Um, some interesting literature has shown that even healthy, pa healthy patients without significant vascular risk factors, if they're taking NSAIDs, such as Advil, too frequently, it actually increases your risk of heart attack and stroke. So these are not benign medications. Now, medications that have been implicated in medication overuse headache that have been shown to cause this include simple analgesics such as NSAIDs, acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, aspirin, Advil, Excedrin, um, tryptans such as Imitrax, Maxalt, combination analgesics such as Fioracet or Fiorinol, um, opioids such as Vicodin and ergotamine, which is not used too commonly these days. So when they looked closely at patients with medication abuse headache as to what type of medications they were taking and what their background was, it was found that the majority had an underlying migraine diagnosis, that the majority overused combination medications such as Excedrin, Fioracet, or Fioranol. And as an aside, I would like to point out in particular about Furacet and Furanol. These medications are illegal in Canada and in Europe because they cause medication overuse headache in almost everybody who uses them. And at the headache conferences, we refer to Furacet as the F word. So most headache experts do not prescribe that medication because it's very problematic. Now, Bullet number three I really want you to focus on, which is that this particular study showed that 76.6% of patients succeeded in withdrawal off of their pain medication. And in my practice, the success rate is over 80%. It's a very treatable problem, and these patients should not feel that they are not treatable just because they're having headache almost every day and they're taking pain medication almost every day. So part of the way that you can help your physician is by disclosing all of your headaches. I can't tell you how often I see a patient in my office 
and I ask how frequently they're having headaches, and they say twice a month. But then on subsequent uh, extracting of their history, what they almost always end up saying is, well, I have my regular headache every day, but I have a severe headache twice a month. So it's really important that you tell your physician about your regular headaches because that counts as a headache day and that helps to guide your treatment. And in addition, make sure that you let your physician know how often you're taking any type of pain medication, including the over-the-counters. So it's not, it's not good for you to be taking Tylenol every day for your headaches and that counts as a pain medication and do make sure that you let your physician know. The treatment of chronic daily headache and medication abuse headache is starting a prophylactic or preventive medication with, with your physician and then your physician helping you to abruptly get off your pain medication. And with the expectation that there typically is a bit of a worsening during the withdrawal period, but it's not typically severe and we take many precautions to increase the comfort during this withdrawal time. And then over a few weeks to a month to two months, the patient typically reverts back to episodic migraine where they have weeks of no headache at all, and then they have one or two migraines a month. So preventive prophylactic medication is severely underutilized. And the literature shows that even if you just have two headache days a month, if they're severe and if nothing makes them go away, prevention should be considered. Now that's a bit on the extreme side because typically we can find something to make your occasional episodic migraine go away. But when prevention should definitely be used is if you're having one or two headaches every week, that is when a preventive medication should be considered. And literature shows, as I mentioned, that migraine prevention is underutilized. In this particular study, almost 40% of patients met criteria for prevention, but only 12% were on a preventive medication. Um, when I bring up the topic of preventive medications with my patients, one of the common responses that I get is, but I don't like taking medication. And it's important for the patient to reflect and realize you are taking medication if you're taking Tylenol every day or Excedrin every day. And an additional point is that preventive medications are not a lifetime medication. Migraine is inherently cyclical, meaning that it flares up and calms down. And typically patients are on preventives for approximately six months to just calm things back down and essentially reset their headache clock, and then we can get you off of them. Another topic that I do want to bring up, and I realize that this is controversial and you certainly will hear differently from other physicians, is that supplements are safe because they're natural. And I'm not advising that you don't take supplements. I just think that the knowledge of supplements should be heightened so that people understand what's really going on here. So supplements are not natural. They're made in factories. They get in capsules somehow. They're not regulated, and they have real biological effects. Now, a few concerns that I have about supplements are bullet number one, which is that because they're not regulated, they're frequently contaminated. And they're contaminated by arsenic and lead and other concerning um, substances. In addition, when independent groups study supplements, they find that they rarely contain the amount that's on the label. And it can have much more of what's on the label or much less. And lastly, um, pretty much most of the time when they look at the long-term effects of taking uh, mega doses of vitamins or supplements, they find that it decreases your lifespan and or causes cancer. For example, we used to recommend high-dose vitamin E for patients with Alzheimer's because we don't really have any treatments for Alzheimer's and the antioxidant effect appeared to be beneficial. But then the study came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine and another similar study came out in New England Journal, which showed that if you take high-dose vitamin E for a prolonged period of time, it shortens your lifespan. So I typically do not recommend supplements, and it's fine if you, if you choose to take it. I just 
try to change the way you think about it, that it's really not natural, and it's a medication, and it's an unregulated medication where the long-term effects have not proven the safety. One of the last points I'd like to make is in 2010, the FDA approved Botox for chronic migraine. And this is another preventive approach that we can take to migraine. Um, I find it to be very effective. The literature supports it's very effective. The literature supports that it's safe. In the migraine patients that have received it, which are very many now, there's never been a a problem. There's never been a serious complication, which in fact is better data than conventional medications, which not infrequently have side effects and occasionally complications. So this is another weapon in our armamentarium against migraine that's relatively recent and has been shown to be very effective. I, I find the history of Botox to be kind of interesting, and to just talk about it a bit, it's been used in neurology for approximately 30 years. And they were using it initially for facial twitches and eye issues. And they found that when they injected in that area, that patient's wrinkles went away. So then the cosmetic doctors started using it for wrinkles. And the average population that receives cosmetic Botox is a woman in her 40s. And that's typically where migraine flares up. And these patients were coming back to their cosmetic doctors, and they were saying, my migraines are going away. So that led to this interest in Botox, and it was studied, and again, it was FDA approved in 2010 as a preventive for chronic migraine. So in conclusion, there are almost 30 million migraine sufferers in the United States, and half of them are undiagnosed. And many of these patients are undiagnosed because they receive diagnosis of sinus headache or tension headache. So in, in order to expand the recognition of migraine, we need to dispel the myths and gain a better understanding of the facts of migraine and make sure that we recognize a pattern of increasing migraine frequency and to be aware of the risk of rebound headache, medication reuse headache, and that pain medication should be used sparingly and effectively, and to remember preventive medication. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you, Dr. Engel. Our first question comes from Jan. She'd like to know what would you suggest the migraine sufferers say to combat the stigma and dismissiveness of migraine? Uh, I'm not sure uh, what should she say to her physician or to her peers, I guess, um, uh, to her physician. She could explain the severity and the disabling effect of this neurological diagnosis. And I suspect from her peers, it's such a common diagnosis that typically if you talk to people, you find that many um, other, many of your friends, many of your colleagues have migraine. So I, I think that these days it's, it is more recognized and less dismissed, and it is recognized as uh, a severe problematic headache. Thank you. Our next question is from Tom. He says when he takes tryptin during a headache, he usually gets relief within four hours, but the headache almost always comes back the next day. Could this just be a 48-hour to 72-hour headache instead of a rebound headache? Yeah, I, I would not call that a rebound headache. Um, I would say that that's an incompletely treated migraine, which is very common. And what I tell my patients is that with migraine, you want to treat infrequently, but when you treat, you want to stomp it out. And what that means is that you don't break your Imitrex in half. You take the full dose. You take it at the onset of your headache. And if you still have any inkling of your migraine at all, after a couple hours, you take a second dose. So typically, by front-loading it like that and really strongly treating it at the beginning, you can prevent this lingering migraine hangover that can persist for a day or so. Now, some patients need to repeat their dose on day two, and that's often fine. You do have to look at the overall frequency, though, and if your patient is refractory to their pain treatment, often they need a preventive medication or a change in their preventive treatment, or sometimes they need an additional medication to take with their tryptan, such as an anti-inflammatory type medication. Thank you. Our next question is from Sophia. 
I've had migraines for about 50 years, and for years I thought they were just sinus headaches until I learned the truth. I am now 69 years old. What is the concern for using Imitrex when you are older? I need authorizations every year now, even though I've had Imitrex since it first came out. Also, the nine pills per month are usually not enough for most migraines. Um, so, Sophia, you bring up a number of points. Number one, it saddens me to hear that for so many years you're diagnosed with sinus headache, and it's unfortunate that that still goes on to this day. Number two, um, the nine Imitrex a month typically should be enough. And if you're running out, it typically means that either that's not the best medicine for you and you're having to repeat it too frequently, or that you're having too many headaches and again, maybe you need a change to your preventive regimen. And then the last point that you made, um, sorry, can you remind me of what her, the second thing that she said was? Um, what are the concerns about taking Imitrex now that she's older? Oh, right. Thank you. Um, so there's somewhat of a theoretical concern due to the uh, vasoconstrictive effect of the tryptans, meaning that they do constrict the blood vessels a bit. And as people are older, if they have what we call vascular risk factors, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, the addition of constricting of the vessels theoretically can increase risk of heart attack or stroke. In fact, there's really little data to support that, and it's more of a theoretical risk. And we do know that frequent bad migraine is a risk factor for stroke. So typically, it's better for your overall health to effectively make your migraines go away. That said, if somebody has significant cardiovascular issues, we often will try to find an alternate treatment to a tryptan. Thank you. Our next question is from Sheena, and she'd like to know your thoughts on avoiding gluten. You know, I, I was talking earlier about food and how there's really not much data for particular food triggers. I'll kind of step back from that stance a bit on gluten, which um, it's true that over the last 10 to 20 years, the food industry has markedly increased the amount of gluten that we're exposed to. They add tons of it to bread so that the shelf life is two weeks instead of one day. So we are exposed to a lot of it, and there is some data that it appears to be pro-inflammatory. So what I typically advise when my patients, and we do know that inflammation will increase your migraine. Um, when my patients ask me about gluten, I, for the most part, will take the stance that if you don't have celiac disease, you're not allergic to gluten, but it's, it, might, it might not be a bad idea to minimize your gluten exposure, and I don't think that it's necessary to buy expensive gluten-free food. Instead, by cutting out processed breads and cereals, you can really decrease the quantity of gluten that you're exposed to, and you might find that to be beneficial. Thanks. Our next question comes from Renee. She's a 42-year-old female who'd like to know any suggestions or treatments to try for someone that has failed most preventative medications, beta blockers, seizure meds, and antidepressants. Rescue medicines almost always work, but she's taken about nine doses a month, and she almost always runs out. She's currently seeing a neurologist, and she's waiting to get into a headache clinic. <laughs> Well, it sounds, based on the little bit of history that I heard there, is that she might be an excellent candidate for Botox. Now, although Botox is FDA approved for chronic migraine, in practice, the insurance, will only, insurance companies will only cover it in patients who have tried and failed two or three conventional preventive medications. So it sounds like she's tried many in different categories, in the antidepressant, in the anti-seizure, in the blood pressure category. And so typically a patient like herself would qualify for Botox, and that might be an excellent option for her. I think our next question is from Tom. Is there any evidence that indicates that long-term use of tryptans can actually make you more susceptible to migraines? Yes, absolutely. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, Long-term frequent use, yes. Um, so frequent use of tryptans can cause the medication to reduce headache that we talked about. Um, on the other hand, um, long-term occasional use of tryptans is just fine. So in somebody who has episodic migraine, they're having two headaches a month, they can take tryptans for 30, 40 years. The tryptans will still work for them, and there does not appear to be a risk. 
Our next question is from Carrie, and she'd like to know how she could go about finding a physician who will work with her to get rid of her chronic daily headache. You know, you really do have to look. Unfortunately, patients with chronic daily headache are, are often dismissed by many physicians, and I would suggest that she look for a headache specialist um, who has particular training in this area, and to stay optimistic because it is a treatable condition. Our next question comes from Colleen, and she wants to know that when you say not to take supplements, do you also mean vitamin D and fish oil? As an FYI, she says fish oil does give her migraines. Any idea why? Um, so let me just clarify that I'm not telling patients not to take supplements. I just want them to be aware of the potential risk and that it's an illusion to say it's natural so it's safe. Um, so the vitamin D question is a very good question, and I'm actually I'm glad that she brought this up. Uh, low vitamin D is really an epidemic right now, and in part, we think it's from the avoidance of the sun. Now, the concerning thing about low vitamin D is that it's been implicated in multiple sclerosis and in many other neurological disorders. So, low vitamin D is important to test for and to treat. And so, I, I treat low vitamin D as different from for example, you're not going to check your ginkgo level in your bloodstream, but you can check your vitamin D level, you can treat it, and you can make sure that it's coming back up to the normal range. So vitamin D, it's important to treat if you have low vitamin D. Um, fish oil, I'm not sure why that would be causing her headaches. I, I'm just not sure about that. All right. Our next question comes from Melanie. What would you suggest for patients who are treatment resistant? having tried preventatives, including anti-epileptics, beta blockers, and Botox. I'm a chronic migraine patient who spends 15 to 20 days a month with migraine um, with limited pain management. And somebody who has failed so many different preventive treatments, often a culprit is that they're really stuck in this medication overuse cycle where they are taking too many pain medications and so some of these patients benefit from an outpatient detox or even an inpatient detox to help them get out of this frequent use of medicines of pain medication. Um, in particular patients who take opioids such as Vicodin frequently are really um, can be difficult to treat because, unfortunately, the opioids cause physical changes in your brain that make you more prone to pain. Um, they make your pain more difficult to treat and things such as brushing your hair, brushing your teeth can actually start to, to hurt because you have these empty pain receptors that are waiting for their vitamin. So I would wonder whether or not the circumstance involves taking too many pain medications. That's a potential thing. Um, uh, without knowing the rest of her history, I would suggest that she perhaps get a second opinion, see a headache specialist. I think your next question is from Reedy. What are the most effective preventative medications? The medications that have the most data to support their efficacy are Depakote, Topamax, Inderol, and Amitriptyline. So those medications have been shown to be effective and to be safe, and the tolerability profile is good. Our next question is from Carrie. I get so exhausted after I've had a migraine. I used to think it was caused from medication, but it doesn't always happen. Is there any way to prevent or treat this exhaustion so that I don't miss work? It's not uncommon to have a hangover after a migraine, and migraine involves relatively severe brain dysfunction. It's not just pain. So it's common before a migraine to feel depressed, to feel sleepy, during the migraine to feel, to feel irritable and after the migraine to feel fatigued. And we don't really have a treatment for the post-migraine fatigue. I think the best approach would be to help to make the migraine resolve as quickly as possible so that the patient is not so wiped out afterwards. Thank you. Our next question is from Jenny. Do you advise for or against taking antihistamines or allergy meds for congestion with migraines? 
I have chronic migraine and an ICG deficiency, which results in frequent sinus infections. I feel these infections trigger more migraines. It sounds like she has a particular additional diagnosis that predisposes her to more sinusitis and sinus infections. And so her sinus infections should be treated. And as I said initially, although most patients who are told they have sinus headache have migraine, I'm not saying there's no such thing as sinusitis. So if her sinus issues need to be treated essentially separately, that's fine. Um, and somebody who doesn't have problematic sinus diagnosis on top of their migraine diagnosis, typically the sinus-like symptoms will resolve with the migraine medications without having to take decongestants. Dolores is saying she's seen on the internet that a headband that shocks your headaches away while you sleep. Have you seen or heard anything new other than surgery that can be done for chronic headaches? So I have seen a bit about these different shocking devices. Um, there's nothing that is FDA approved for use in the United States. They're looking at them now, and it's an interesting potential approach that, doesn't, that does not involve medication. Um, the surgery issue, uh, has, surgery for migraine has not been validated by research, and thus far it's being met by quite a bit of skepticism because of the potential downside. And Linda would like to know, do you find your patients have chronic depression along with their headaches? Yes, it's very common for patients with chronic migraine to have insomnia and depression, and the three go together. And it becomes a vicious cycle because the more you're in pain, the more depressed you are, and the worse you sleep, and the worse you sleep, the worse your headaches are. So yes, it, it, it go, they go hand in hand. And it's important to address all of these issues um, to help the patient to feel better. Our next question comes from Sheena. What other options are there to treat status migraine other than steroids? Um, there are a number of other options. Um, we at Scripps Clinic, where I work, we use uh, Toradol injection, we use IV Depakote, we use anti-nausea medications such as Phenergan and Compazine, which are wonderful for status migraineosis, which by the way is migraine that's been going on for more than three days essentially. Um, the anti-nausea medications don't just help the nausea, they help the migraine, they help the headache. Um, and there are other uh, treatments as well, such as IV, DHE, and um, other things that are used a little bit less commonly these days because we're, for the most part, having quite a bit of luck with Depakote and with the antiemetics, which are the anti-nausea medicines. All right, our next question comes from Terry. How many headaches a month are defined as episodic? My headaches started as episodic and have increased over the past few years. I'm trying alternative therapies to get my headaches back down to episodic. Also, what is your experience of acupuncture as an alternative treatment? So um, episodic migraine is one to two headaches a week maximally. Um, so really it's about four to six headache days per month. Um, chronic migraine is greater than 15 days a month. So there's a little bit of a window between the four to six to the 15, and it kind of varies uh, for the patient. Um, and acupuncture, there's not fantastic data for acupuncture for migraine. There's better data for biofeedback for migraine. However, some patients do experience benefit from acupuncture as well, and there's certainly no, no downside to trying it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Colleen. She says her migraines have been well controlled for the last year and a half on Topamax, but she can't take any others. Just, she's just been diagnosed with optic nerve cupping, which is, I understand, can lead to glaucoma. Should she still take Topamax? So this is potentially a very concerning question that she certainly that she certainly should immediately talk to her neurologist about. One of the risks of Topamax is that it can cause glaucoma. So in my patients, if there's indication of glaucoma, I don't use Topamax, and it, that is a uh, a very important thing for her to address very quickly because you can lose your sight if you have severe glaucoma. Our next question is from Sophia. She says she can't even drink a glass of wine without triggering a stuffy nose and then a migraine. 
is there any wine that you could suggest that does not cause migraine? It seems like an allergic reaction. So thanks for bringing that up. And again, back to the food issue, although there's really no good data that, that any particular foods cause migraine, there is data that alcohol, in particular red wine, can trigger migraine. And it's not exactly understood why that is. There might be some of the components of the red wine. Um, it seems that patients may be less prone to getting a, an alcohol-induced migraine with white wine, but it's very much patient dependent and some patients really can't seem to tolerate alcohol at all. Tom has recently read about a plastic surgeon using a type of facial surgery, severing some of the facial muscles and nerves to give migraine relief at the Medical University of South Carolina. Have you heard anything about this? Yeah, and this refers back to one of the earlier questions. So there has been a lot in the news about migraine surgery, which, as he said, involves severing some of the, the nerves that go to the forehead. Um, there is not good data to support this approach, and it is surgery, and I would not want to encourage unnecessary surgery. So at this point in time, I would say that it's not clear whether or not it's effective. Renee would like for you to... Um further explain how Botox injections work. Her doctor has suggested it, but she's somewhat fearful. She said she's not, she doesn't have a fear of needles, but needles in her head sounds scary. So I can certainly understand that. And um, let me reassure you that really it's um, an extremely safe treatment. And the needle that we use is a very small needle. And it does involve 31 shots, which, which sounds like a lot of shots, but it really only takes about 5 to 10 minutes. We have a standardized protocol of injection sites involving the forehead, the temples, the back of the head, the neck and shoulders, and it's almost always minimally uncomfortable. Occasionally patients benefit from a topical numbing cream that they can put on beforehand. Um, occasionally patients with severe anxiety about needles can take, say, a Valium beforehand. But uh, for the most part, patients tolerate it just fine, and the minimal amount of injection pain is much better than the pain of migraine. Barbara would like for you to explain what other chemical and hormonal changes are occurring in the body before, during, and after a migraine. Well, migraine involves changes in serotonin, in dopamine, in many different brain chemicals. Um, it can be triggered by changes in female hormones. Drop in the level of, of estrogen, for example, can trigger migraine. It's a very complicated interconnected network of hormones and pain chemicals. A lot of it is not fully understood. They're working on understanding it better. Um, after the migraine has been activated, we know that there's release of inflammatory and pain chemicals. Um, which creates a process that we call sterile inflammation, meaning that it's not an infection, but you have a lot of inflammation around the blood vessels and around the, the meninges, which is the skin around the brain, and the inflammation appears to be part of what causes the pain of migraine. I'd say the science and the refining the, the chemical understanding is still going on, um, but we're learning more about it every day. All right. Our next question comes from Melanie. As a 40-year-old female migraine nurse since my teens, I'm not taking any opioids or opiates for pain. I take less than 10 Fioracet over the course of a month. I also limit my tryptin use to no more than two days per week to avoid rebound. I use steroids and Zofran when I am in status migraine. I'm currently seeing a headache specialist. Is there anything after Botox? Well, you know, if you are to add up all the days of pain medications that you're taking, it is too much and it's likely putting you into rebound. If you're going to add up all the days of Furoset and all the days of your tryptan use, it sounds like it's adding up to, to more than, it's adding up to too many days. You can't take any pain medication greater than two days a month. So that means any combination, it can't add up to a total of more than, pardon me, two days per week. And it certainly sounds like she's taking more than that. So one of the things that she may want to address with her physician is how to decrease the amount of pain medication that she's taking to help to get her out of rebound. Um, I think that would be one of the first things that I would try. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kim. 
what are the potential down, downsides of surgeries for migraine? Um, well, you know, surgery is a big deal. It's very traumatic to the body. It's, it's difficult psychologically for somebody to go through. And I would never recommend a surgery that has not been proven. Um, and so there's always risk of infection. There's risk of a bad cosmetic outcome. They, they are, after all, doing an incision um, nearby the face. Um, there's risk of injury to the nerve that could potentially worsen the pain later on. For example, we know that sometimes when a nerve is severed, um, although initially the patient is numb, with time they can actually develop severe pain at the injury site. So uh, those are potential problems that come to mind um, at this time. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention and for your excellent questions, which prompted me to talk about more important topics that I hadn't included in my slides. Um, please feel free to ask further questions that maybe I can uh, answer through the National Headache Foundation for you. And make sure to advocate for yourself to your physicians as to the seriousness of your headache problem and how frequently you're having headache and how it's impacting on your quality of life. I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening, Dr. Engel. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. We will have another session next Tuesday, and that will be on um, concussions in student-athletes. So if you could join us next week, we ask that you please sign up. Again,